We've just gotten started with our meeting. Our recording is live and public. I'm just going to wait another minute and see if we get Commissioner Mejia or, um, or Romero Chavez from the county. Jim, could we maybe start with introductions and hope? Yeah, I'll, 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 get, I'll get going on that in just a sec. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things I've discovered with our city Zooms is we aren't waiting long enough for the attendees to actually be in the meeting before we convene it. And so I'm gonna give that pause and then I'll go ahead. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the March 18th meeting of the Regional Housing Council for Thurston County. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and do introductions and. Uh, we, we do have a quorum. We're missing one member, so hopefully she'll join us before we get through uh, introductions. So why don't I start in the city of Yelm. Who's here from the city of Yelm, Mayor Foster? Well, it is I, uh, J.W. Foster, representing Yelm and all the South County cities. Glad to be here. Thank you. Let's go to Tumwater. Michael. Hi, Michael Altauser, Tumwater City Council, and on the staff side, we are joined by John Doan, our city administrator, and Brad from our planning team. Thanks for having us. Okay, welcome. And how about the city of Lacey, Carolyn? Hi, Carolyn Cox from Lacey City Council, and we're joined by our city manager, Scott Spence. Scott, wave at the nice people, and <laughs> Rick Walk, our director of uh, community planning and development. Great, thank you. And so then we'll do Olympia next. So I'm Jim Cooper from the City Council. Uh, and on, I think, uh, Keith, are you the only other one? So yes, sir. Keith Andy is the City Manager. Thank you. Okay, great. And look at that, perfect timing as usual. Uh, so we'll go ahead and um, go to Thurston County and ask Commissioner Mejia uh, and then the staff to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Carolina Mejia. I am the commissioner for Thurston County for District 1. And we have an array of staff here tonight. So I guess we can start with Tom Webster because that's who I see first. Hey, Tom Webster with Public Health and Social Services. And I just, Ramiro just asked me to send him the link. So I will be sending him the link and he should be joining us shortly. And we also have Keely, why don't you go? Hello, my name is Keely Marino. I am with um, Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. I am the Thurston County Homeless Prevention and Affordable Housing Coordinator. Jacinda Stelchis, also with uh, Thurston County Affordable Housing Program Coordinator as well. Okay, then we have... Go ahead. So I was just gonna say, I don't, I don't think we have any other um, county people. Yeah, so we just have an add-on of Carrie Ratlin from the City of Olympia has joined us. Um, and I think, does that cover introductions? Lenny Greenstein, Lacey City Council. Oh, Lenny, I'm sorry. Thank you, no Lenny. Worries. I didn't even catch that you were forgotten, so I apologize. Uh, no worries. Okay. I, I think Joan should be joining us shortly as well, my ultimate okay. Joan Kathy. Great. And we'll keep an eye out for Romero as well. So that takes us to the agenda. Is everybody okay with the agenda? Okay, great. Um, and then uh, we have our minutes in our packet. So if anybody has any comments on the minutes, um, well, I'll do that after public comment because it's on the agenda. Sorry about that, I'm jumping ahead. So for public comment this evening, we have uh, five folks signed up. And so we have the uh, 10 minutes allotted in the meeting. So. I'll give uh, two minutes to each person. And uh, for, um, for staff's benefit, I'm gonna just call them in the order of the email that you sent me earlier this afternoon. So uh, starting with Beard Francis. Sorry, I don't see that name in the attendee list. Okay, and then I have Aaron Sauerhoff.
also not present at this moment. Okay. And Aaliyah Phipps? Again, also not present at this moment. Okay. And Peter Cook? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Peter. Okay, thank you for listening to me, council members. Uh, I am with the Faith Alliance Initiative for Tiny Houses, and I spoke to you a couple of months ago about the possibility of uh, restarting the conversation on getting tiny house projects going on faith community property. So just to bring you up to date, uh, we have carried out an analysis of the five tiny house villages in Olympia now, which yielded some very interesting results. And I have given that to several of you that I see on this meeting, uh, Rick and Keeley and Keith in particular and Carrie. Um, and I tried to send it to Kelly, but she seems to be out of town. So but anyway, I can attach that if you want or send it to someone. So that uh, really covers the uh, five house, five tiny house villages. And one of the interesting results uh, are, first of all, they totally house about 80 people in Olympia. And in terms of performance, there are 40 to 50 percent of the people in the transition oriented tiny house villages are moving on to permanent housing. So it's been relatively successful. That's in line with Lehigh numbers for Seattle. And we have also started the conversation going with churches here in the area. Uh, we have a conversation going with five churches in Lacey and two in Olympia who are looking at the uh, possibility of tiny house villages. Uh, we have a general goal of getting 20 churches involved. However, this also requires partnerships with municipalities. So there's a conversation that needs to be needs to happen with both the faith communities and the governments about how to make this partnership work like it has in Olympia. Thank you, Peter. So Peter, just so you know, Tom Webster from staff has the has the slide deck and he'll, he said he'll distribute it to everyone. So thanks for sending it. Okay, great. So, so we're looking at, uh, like you are looking at what is the long term plan for housing and how to get there and how to get units as quickly as possible. And we see the tiny house villages as a short term intermediate step, transitionary step. Uh, that could be part of the planning to get something that's relatively quick to put on the ground, either through faith communities or through uh, city operations like Plum Street Village in Olympia. Great. So that's it for me for now. Thank you very much, Peter. And so now I'll go to Jeff Thomas. Hello. Uh, I'm Jeff Thomas. I'm a contractor in Olympia, Washington, and um, have been involved with some political housing issues. And I want to talk to you about um, the harm reduction mentality um, applied to homelessness and to construction um, of new units. And, um, you know, I'm an environmentalist on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, small buildings and higher occupancy of buildings can cut um, energy use more than things like extra insulation. You know, if you want to double your energy efficiency, you can double your occupancy. Um, and, and so I think that we need more thought into extending some of the ex exceptions that we're making for tiny houses, uh, like these micro houses or building codes for um, things like uh, small scale apartments and houses or, you know, ADUs in these small houses. And I know you're looking at some of those. Um, and I think that we can really move forward on making it happen. And like one ex 
example of that I could save a huge amount of money for affordable housing is just allowing um, ADUs to be pumped from pump drugs for the sewage um, and ease up things like um, sidewalk, uh, things like that. Things that add a lot of cost, but also if things are really small, we, we should consider for affordable, like the kind of emergency for affordable housing, having different energy code requirements um, for those um, because they will use less per occupancy than a bigger house that meets, meets the code. Um, so that's all I have to say about, about that. I appreciate you hearing me out on this and appreciate your work. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, um, John, do you see Beard, Aaron, or Aaliyah before we move on? Uh, no, I haven't seen any of them show up. There is one other person that has their hand raised. I don't know if they intend wanted to comment or not. Pat Cole. Yeah, I think because we had some no shows, we can do that. If you want to promote Pat and 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 let her let them unmute. Hi, Pat. Hi, I didn't even know you could see or hear me. I, I don't, I'm not on the screen, so. so uh, just, just so you know, I'm, I'm bending the rule because you raised your hand, but we like to have people sign up in advance so we can keep it, keep it moving, okay? Go ahead. Well, I didn't, I didn't intentionally raise my hand. I didn't even think you could see me. Oh, cool, okay. Did you <laughs> want to make a comment? Well, no, just real comment. Uh, just interested in what you're doing. Just to let you know, I've talked to, uh, a number of people about, really not about housing, but uh, the condition of the camps. And I don't know if that's something that this group addresses or not, but that's my interest. And so I thought I would watch and see or uh, find out any other resources if anybody else is interested in that, in particular right. cleaning the camps. Okay, well, you might be interested in part of our agenda this evening. So thank you for being here and thank you everyone. Uh, just to see if there's any quick responses from the uh, council members um, to any public comment before we move on. Okay. And I see that we've been um, joined by County Manager Romero Chavez uh, and our Public Health and Social Services Director, Shelly Slaughter. So welcome, both of you. Okay, so that will take us to the approval of the February minutes. Is there a motion? Move approval of February minutes. Second. By Foster. Okay. I got a motion and a second. Any amendments or discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. So um, that takes us to the proposed uh, change of a meeting time. So we have one alternate option, uh, which is the third Thursday at 4.30. Um, which is what we're on now, or the fourth Wednesday at four o'clock. And the staff are under the impression that the fourth Wednesday will work uh, so that we can relieve Lacey of meeting on their council night and let them have a consistent time for the public to be able to track what they're doing. Um, is there any, any opposition to moving to the fourth Wednesday at four o'clock? I think that that works for me. I, it was my understanding that the other option was the third Wednesday at 4.30s. That was I incorrect? Tom, can you? I, I, so that's the, our current meeting time. We're currently meeting the third Thursday or oh, the third Wednesday, sorry. Um, yeah, that's what I thought I read. Maybe I just misread it. Well, we're on the third Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, but I thought the other option was the third Wednesday. Third Wednesday is inner city transit. It starts oh, okay. At well, the fourth one works for me. I, th I think so when we talked about it internally, I think that we thought it was the third Wednesday and that worked a little better for Joan, but she's the alternate. And so the fourth Wednesday works fine for me. So okay. Everyone else is okay with it. Yeah. Inner city transit oh. would wipe out two of us. So right. Yeah, it's fine. So everyone else is okay with that shift? Great. Okay, so we're, we're moving the meeting starting in April to the fourth Wednesday at 4 p.m. Uh, Tom and Nicole get the appointments changed 
Um, and then also, Tom, we need to shift the um, the um, plan, the executive planning call by a week if we can too. Okay. Yes. Great. Anything else on meeting day? Thank you everyone for going through those hoops to, to narrow that down. It's very, the first time in 10 years for me that I've tried to change a meeting and it's been successful. So uh, council member Madrone will be appreciative of that as well. Um, okay, so that takes us to uh, the county, uh, the Thurston Regional Planning Council Housing Needs Assessment and Action Plan. And I apologize, I've forgotten who from TRPC is presenting this. Uh, Tom? Yeah, so we have Katrina Van Every um, presenting, if um, John, if you can elevate her. And also, um, I believe Amy Buckler from the City of Olympia is also going to help with the presentation. And I might have missed it as I came in, but Michael Ambrogi is also here uh, for the presentation from TRPC. Um, well, I, as mentioned, I'm Katrina Van Every. I work at Thurston Regional Planning Council, and I've been working with the cities of Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater on this um, housing action plan, and specifically the needs assessment um, that a lot of the work that the cities are, are moving forward on are, is based off of. Um, so give me just a second to share my screen. All right, so as I mentioned, um, Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater, as you may know, have been going through this joint effort um, to look at the needs of, for affordable housing in our community. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater do have a one interconnected housing market. Uh, and identifying that baseline demographic and market data can help ground the work that each of the communities is moving forward on with regard to housing affordability. Um, so this project is made up of four pieces that uh, TRPC has been involved in. One is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, which I'm gonna go over with you today. Uh, and that's really all about the trends and demographic information on housing, income, and Lacey Olympia and Tumwater. Uh, as part of that, we also developed a gap analysis to understand the amount and the type of housing needed over the next 25 years. Uh, really, again, to ensure residents will have access to affordable housing. Uh, we performed a landlord survey uh, to gain a better understanding of the local rental market and really with an emphasis on understanding what's happening with those single family homes that are not typically reported in rental data. And then finally, uh, we've been working and developing a menu of actions uh, for Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater that they can look at uh, implementing as they develop their individual housing action plans. So this project has really been funded uh, through three separate uh, grants from the Department of Commerce. Um, so each city uh, uh, was able to obtain a grant uh, from Commerce uh, and hence we're working together and pooling resources to get uh, more bang for the buck. Um, so the thing to keep in mind about the needs assessment and the data in it is that the sources uh, of data are generally pre-pandemic um, and this is a long-term planning process. So we're looking at a 25 year horizon. So while much of the data and statistics used in the assessment were established prior to the out outbreak, we also know that the estimates and forecasts and gap analysis do not take into account all these changes that have happened in employment and housing um, with residents, landlords, renters, and homeowners and businesses. Uh, so as we're going, as the cities are going through the, this planning process and moving into the future, they'll be continuing to monitor the long-term effects of COVID-19. Um, the pandemic and incorporating changes to address these effects as needed in the local actions they will take under their individual housing action plans. Uh, and then finally, uh, equity is an overarching uh, lens for this project um, in both regarding the menu of actions that we've identified as well as the data that we've gathered as part of the needs assessment. Um, because when you have folks that have unequal opportunity 
uh, to gain housing, it impacts them separately. But when, when someone doesn't have housing that's affordable for them, it's something that needs to be looked at. So just some really quick stats. Uh, if you didn't know already, Thurston County has a growing population. Uh, and we know that about 65% or 13 and 20 Thurston County residents live in Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater or their urban growth areas. Uh, so we are going to see rather significant uh, growth in the next 25 years. We also are gonna have a lot of new households. So, and we also know that about one in two new households will be in Lacey, Olympia and Tumwater. Uh, between 2020 and 2045 will be low income. Um, so as we are looking at um, those changes over time, we're gonna have to look at ways to address that, that deeper need for folks that are low income. Uh, the regional housing needs assessment, uh, we also looked at equity and housing affordability. So we know that people of color, so those that are uh, Hispanic or Latino of any race and people who identify as any race other than white alone, they are more likely to be cost burdened, um, meaning they spend more than 30% of their, their income on housing costs. They're less likely to be homeowners. They are more likely to experience homelessness and they are um, uh, more likely to have a lower income than their white non-Hispanic counterparts. And we know that one in four people in our community is a person of color. So the regional housing needs assessment looks, or is kind of broken into four pieces. One is the community profile that looks at population and household characteristics uh, and some of the unique housing needs in our community. So those that have disabilities, uh, veterans and military folk uh, and those experiencing homelessness. We also looked at or include a workforce profile that talks about the local workforce characteristics, a housing inventory, including the housing supply. So what, what do we have and what is coming down the pipeline? And then a needs assessment. So looking at where what's the gap, uh, where are the gaps and do we have enough land to meet that demand? So where are the gaps? We found from the needs assessment, seven key findings. Um, these are the things that we really need to do in our community. One is to reduce the cost of housing for low income and cost burden households. A second one is to increase the inventory of housing for all households, increasing the variety of housing sizes and types, increasing the stock of housing options needed for aging seniors, maintaining the existing housing stock, uh, including improvements uh, such as energy efficiency and air quality, uh, increasing household wealth by providing those safe, stable options for renting, as well as those pathways to home ownership. And then finally, increasing permanent housing options for people with disabilities and those at risk of or experiencing homelessness. So let's just kind of dig into some of that data. Um, we talk about reducing um, the cost of housing for low income and cost burden households. We know that one in four Thurston County households is low income and cost burdened. Um, and when we look at that more deeply, we know that 13% um, of Thurston County households are low income and severely cost burdened. And that means that they spend more than 50% of their income on housing costs. Um, and so when you look at uh, the number of households that are cost burden or severely cost burden, it's no surprise to see that those at the lower income thresholds um, have a, a lot harder time finding housing within their budget so that they're not spending too much on housing. So this uh, chart here just kind of gives you some ideas of breakpoints for what someone's annual income is um, what the hourly wage equivalent is and what, what can they afford for a, a monthly rent or mortgage payment. So in this, um, think about this as a one or two person household where one person works or two people work part-time, um, kind of gives you equivalent. Um, what you see here is that someone who makes minimum wage, which is now $13.69 an hour, uh, they can reasonably afford $700 a month on housing costs. 
Um, but that puts them out of reach of the average rent in Thurston County, as well as the median home sale price. It's just too expensive. And that's the same for people who make 50% of the median family income. And even for some of those that make all up to 80% of the median family income. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at who are we affecting or who is affected by this, there are a lot of families and households in our community that are affected by um, housing affordability. It's not just people on the lowest echelons, but uh, it goes up quite a bit higher than uh, what most of us think. The other thing to keep in mind about this is this chart shows, you know, what's the monthly rent or mortgage payment, but that doesn't take into account the cost of utilities, which impact the affordability of a home or an apartment. Uh, so for housing to truly be affordable, you need to take into consideration all housing costs that includes utilities and rent mortgage taxes combined. So we need to be increasing the inventory of housing for all households. Um, we have almost 61,000 more dwelling units anticipated over the next 25 years. Uh, we know that almost 30,000 of them will be built in Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater in their urban growth areas. Um, and we also know that most housing needs are going to be taken care of by the private sector. Uh, but as I think we alluded to in that previous slide, some needs are just not going to be at a market rate solution. Um, there needs to be other solutions addressed through public sector and housing nonprofits. Um, so this just shows, again, over time, where we are today, about 80,000 uh, housing units, um, and where we're going to be going in about 25 years, so almost 120,000. We also need to be looking at increasing the variety of housing sizes and types. So about 65% of households in Lacey, Olympia, and Tomwater have only one or two people. 44% um, of housing units in Lacey and in the cities are studios or one, one or two bedroom units, which for a lot of folks would meet their needs. Um, but again, when there's a 65% of households uh, that may or may not be com competing for that 44% uh, that are sized for their household, uh, it can be hard to find something in your price point um, in, yeah. Uh, and we know that 50% of housing units are owned by the occupant and the other 50% are rentals. So we really need to look at um, finding or establishing housing variety based on unit size, based on the type of building it's in and based on the tenure of the tenant. Um, so this is a, to a comparison between household size and home size. And what you see here is that we have a lot of one and two person households. Um, you know, and they're not perfectly evenly split between owner occupied and renter occupied units. Um, but when you look at the home sizes available, uh, even, you know, for studios, you will not be able to own something of that size, even if it's what you may want to uh, establish for yourself. Um, even those one bedroom units, most of those are renter occupied. So you're not having a lot of um, ownership uh, opportunities there. And then even with two bedroom units, which might really work well for those smaller households, uh, the opportunity to own those again is, is, is pretty limited. So that means that folks that may make a choice if uh, there was more variety out there for a smaller unit are being pushed into those larger units. Um, and that again, affects their ability to uh, afford their housing. So this chart shows how our home sizes have changed over time in Thurston County or in the cities. So in the 80s, more than half of um, houses uh, were less than 1,500 square feet in size. Um, and in 2010s, it was about 11%. So even though our household sizes have gotten smaller over the last 40 plus years, um, our houses have actually gotten quite a bit larger. So we are also needing to look at housing types uh, or yeah, types of housing units uh, by the building they're in 
Uh, when you look at Lacey Olympia and Tum Water combined, about 64% are single family and townhouse units. Um, you know, we have 22%, which isn't terrible for multifamily units. We have very small margins for um, two, three, and fourplex units, as well as mobile homes. So those middle ground options that are really affordable for people to buy and to rent just aren't available for, for folks out there. Another of those gaps and needs that we've identified is increasing the stock of housing needed for those our, our aging senior population. Um, so just as our population is growing, our senior population is also growing. And by 2045, uh, about 23% of the population is anticipated to be 65 or older. And so we really need to be looking at meeting that growing demographic, making sure that we have housing options for seniors that of all ability, ages and ability. Uh, when you look at these two pie charts comparing 2020 and 2045 senior populations, what you see is that um, our, our advanced seniors, those that are 80 or older, are growing precipitously compared to what we are today. So today there's about 20% of the senior population that's 80 or older. Um, by 2045, that's anticipated to be around 38%. We also need to look at maintaining what we have. Um, the existing housing stock is, or those older homes are, are more typically more affordable than your newer constructions uh, homes. Uh, we know that less than 2% of housing units are considered substandard, meaning they don't have complete uh, plumbing and kitchen facilities. So for plumbing facilities, that's hot and cold running water, a bathtub or a shower. Excuse me, for kitchen facilities, that's a sink with a faucet, a stove or range, and a refrigerator. Um, unfortunately, our data on the state of our housing, uh, our existing housing stock is pretty limited. Uh, we don't know very much about uh, homes and, and housing units that experience poor indoor air quality, and that can be from exposure to mold. We don't know if how many of these older homes have peeling paint and lead exposure. Uh, we don't know how many have infestation from vermin and rats and insects. Um, and we don't know how many have maintenance issues, um, such as electrical systems and plumbing systems and heating systems, because that is an area of maintenance that's needed over time, and we just don't have enough information on that. We also need to look at increasing household wealth. How, how can we increase household wealth um, through housing? And that is by providing safe, stable options for rental, as well as pathways to home, home ownership. Um, you know, we, our economy has grown and our wages have grown to some extent with that. Um, but our rents and our, our, the cost of buying a home is increasing at a faster pace than what our, our incomes are. Uh, and that's pricing more people out of the market. So this is just showing the average wage versus the average rent in Thurston County and showing you kind of the difference over uh, those two time periods. Uh, and then this is uh, comparing, again, average wage against home sale prices. So you can see how much it's increased. Um, for average wages, it's about 0.4% per year, uh, 2002 to 2018, and that's the time period shown here. Um, for sale price, how, home sale prices, it's 2.5%. So you see quite a big difference in what people can afford. Permanent housing options, we need those for people with disabilities as well as those at risk of or experiencing homelessness. And so when we look at our disabled population, um, folks with disabilities, as you get older, you are more likely to have a disability. Um, for our folks that are experiencing homelessness, we know that one in three of, of these uh, people is chronically homeless. Uh, and this is, a uh, situation where 
those uh, wrap our permit supportive housing with those wraparound services uh, is really essential. Um, part of not only addressing um, the homeless crisis, homeless response plan, but it's also a way to ensure that housing is affordable for people that are least likely and least able to uh, find that safe and stable and permanent housing option. So from all that data that we, I just kind of glossed over and there's a lot more in the needs assessment, um, we looked at developing that menu of actions with a stakeholder group and we identified six strategies for addressing those housing gaps and needs that we just went over. One is increasing the supply of permanent affordable housing for really we're concentrating on the folks that make 80% or less of the area median income. Uh, we also wanna look at um, making it easier for households to access housing and stay housed. We are looking at expanding the overall uh, housing supply by making it easier uh, to build all types of housing projects. We need to look at increasing the variety of housing choices, um, continually building on the resources that we already have and the collaboration that has been happening as uh, this is a great example of that at the Regional Housing Council and public understanding to improve implementation of housing strategies. And that sixth um, strategy is to establish a permanent source of funding for low income housing. Um, you know, one thing that I wanna emphasize it, with these gaps and needs, as well as these strategies that we've um, organized the actions in the, the menu of actions under, these are all important. There, one of them isn't more important than the other. It's not an either or situation. It's a look at all doing all of them all and, um, because as soon as we are addressing one part of a housing affordability in our community, we can also look at addressing the other things. So I just uh, want to go over the next few steps that the cities are undertaking. So with all this background information that the cities have, um, they'll each be considering uh, potential actions um, to take at the in jurisdiction level and how to incorporate those into their individual housing action plans. Um, each city will conduct its own community outreach um, and that may include prioritizing actions, uh, additional stakeholder engagement and other things. Uh, you may have seen the city of Olympia's um, online housing form that they're, they've put together and a story map and a survey. So that's an example of what City of Olympia is doing and both Lacey and Tom Water are developing their own uh, out, outreach uh, projects. Uh, and then finally, each city will adopt their own housing action plan. Uh, this is a condition of the, the grant that the city's received and those are all gonna look very a little different. Um, so Lacey has done a lot of work already and is probably a, ahead of the curve for, for most of us uh, in that they produce their um, housing affordable housing strategy. And so you'll see a lot of what has already been done. And you see also that the cities have taken a lot of steps in the last couple of years. Um, Tumwater has made a lot of a, a big stride in adopting some new uh, code amendments recently. So with that, I'm just gonna leave my contact information as well as Michael Ambrogi. We've both worked on this uh, project together uh, and uh, are happy to answer any questions you have about the data and the reports uh, produced as part of the project. Um, and if you have specific questions about what each of the cities is doing in their next steps as they look at adopting their individual housing action plans, uh, you can talk to Ryan Andrews at the City of Lacey Brad Medred uh, with Tumwater and Amy Buckler with Olympia. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and I'm sure that Amy and Brad are well, and, and Rick are all welcome to chime in as well. Thank you, Katrina. Open floor, what do you have? Go ahead, Mayor Foster. Thanks, Jim. Hey, I just wanted to point out what you already know, 
Um, in listening to Katrina's uh, presentation just now, the work that she and Michael and team have been doing at TRPC is phenomenal. This is where we get the best data. As chair of the TRPC right now, maybe I'm a little biased in that, but uh, regardless, uh, these, this, this, these data are what are feeding all of our programs and demonstrating the, the need that we recognize uh, and that we're trying to apply solutions to. So just a tip of the hat to the, the great team at TRPC. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I, I'd second JW's comments. I think this is a really incredible document and a really great resource for us and for our staff to have. My, my sort of question is about the grant. Is that renewable? Are we able to pursue that again so that in 2022, we can sort of reassess how things look, how the landscape looks in a knock on wood post COVID world um, and whether I don't know, it would be worth sort of pursuing again, because some of the things in here seem like they would be very valuable to keep updated, particularly around some of the, the gap analysis. I know that our mayor P is, is really interested in making sure that we have a firm and solid understanding of where our affordable housing units exist and also what we need to invest in in order to make sure that we're meeting the need out there. And that seems like it could be a moving target over time. So having it being really dialed in in terms of what the need is seems like it would be an invaluable piece of information for us to all have. And I can um, probably respond to the grant. The grant cycle is, is a, right now a one-time grant. It was uh, authorized through, I think it's House Bill 1923, two uh, last year's two legislative sessions ago. And what it was, was uh, there's a couple different things that create housing uh, options in local communities. And one of them was to do a uh, housing action plan. And it had a, uh, it charged Carmers to uh, provide uh, grants up to $100,000 to local jurisdictions to do this. Uh, we, we saw this opportunity because of <clears throat> our markets are so intertwined, but yet we have unique differences between the jurisdictions. But the value of trying to do a, a, a joint effort to look at the, the, this housing uh, data analysis and combine our grant applications into uh, to a combined application of commerce which they approved, which now, now we had as a region $300,000 to do some work with versus $100,000 individually. So uh, with that, we uh, entered into interlocal agreement between Olympia, Lacey and Tomwater and, and TRPC and started this effort. And that is why too, as, as we go forward, we got this joint data and then we all, all adopt our individual housing action plans because now we have some regional coordination of that. What's, what does it look like across the entire area? But also what the great work that Katrina and Michael did is broke it down to the jurisdictional level so we can also hone in on those unique differences and, and sweet spots that we need to hit as each individual, but coordinate it as a whole. So it's a long way to say that this grant is, is a one-time grant to my knowledge unless the, um, the legislature re-ups it in a, in a future year. Uh, but we have been talking about the regional table about how we keep this data updated and going. And that's going to be where we continue that regional coordination and working with uh, TRPC. Um, and also, I just want to add, too, is, is this has been a, a, a really uh, great effort. I'm actually really jazzed because this is the first time I started a housing discussion with our planning commission with this richness of data. I mean, usually we, we kind of go in, we're, we're picking um, census data and broader level data and and Katrina and Michael have done a phenomenal job leading this effort and we give us some, a, a, a foundation to build upon. And then also with all the jurisdictional team with Amy and Brad and Ryan and everybody coming to the table and working on this. So I just wanna commend the work that's been done so far. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I, I just have one, one quick question. Oh, go ahead, Amy. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great presentation, Katrina. I just really wanted to echo one of the things that Katrina said about all the strategies being important. Sometime in the in the public discourse, I hear it phrased as a choice between either you're going to focus only on low income affordable housing or you're going to focus on getting, you know, pri the private sector to build housing. And we need both and and all. And it's really important that we stay focused on that. We do know that the private sector is going to build most of the housing we need. When we look at the number, you know, we're talking about 30,000 new housing units by 2045. Um, 
But also, I think when we hone in on the number of low income households that are projected for 25 or 2045, we can see that that's a very high number. That's tens of thousands of households, a lot of them at the extremely low income and very low income levels. And we know that it's harder for the private sector to provide that type of housing, usually requires some kind of government subsidy. So in my mind, I, you know, I, to me, I think this points to cities starting to have a stronger focus and doing what we can to help and our partners develop more low-income affordable housing, um, perhaps than we have in the past. And I think it raises a question as we look at those numbers, asking ourselves, are we making use of all the available tools that we have to do that? Because the resources are limited. Um, and also, I think it, it, it begs the question of, do we even have enough tools available to us as cities to fill that gap? And that's why one of the things that we've done in the housing needs assessment is identify um, a legislative agenda, because we are going to need to work together to advocate uh, at the state and federal level for additional tools that we can use to help our partners uh, fill that gap for our community. Thank you, Amy. Carolyn? Well, a couple of things. Uh, quickly, a question to uh, Katrina. Have you all been in touch with uh, Thurston County Health and Social Services about the data that Thurston Thrives has been collecting? I know they've done landlord surveys. The Housing Action Team also has collected quite a bit of data. And I believe the Community Action Council has a good bit of information as well. So, I mean, I realize this study is done for now, but if we're looking at tracking forward, if you haven't tapped those sources, I I would recommend that you do. <clears throat> and then to the group, I would pose the question, you know, we've, we've kind of talked around the edges of taking advantage of the um, 1590 legislation that allows for councilmatic um, votes on establishing um, home funds for this. And <clears throat> I realize we're not gonna do this tonight, but I just wondered if we could at least tap the group for interest level on pursuing this. And if we are, how quickly we could do this, whether the housing council would like to make a recommendation to our jurisdictions. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that this legislation uh, poses <clears throat> quarterly imp implementation periods. And unfortunately, October is not one of them. So if, you know, we, we could lose out on a couple mil this year if we were able to just jump and go pretty quickly on this. Um, I realize that's not an easy ask or a lift to do that, but I just want to kind of throw that out to the group and see where we are. I would like to very quickly answer the first question from Carolyn raised about the, uh, the data. Uh, we have been meeting with the, the HAD data team and trying to look for areas that we can we can build on as a sort of a regional. So when we look at the data, we get the same answers, or we're at least asking the same questions in the same way, so we can we can interpret that way. But Great. the 1590 is a very good topic to, to to discuss, and I'll let you guys do that. Thanks, Brad. Well, let me let me ask my questions, and then I'll come back to that. Okay, Carolyn. Um, so just real quick. The, the urban growth areas. So I, I was surprised the county wasn't a partner in, in this. And it just correct my, to help me with my assumption. Is that because the county will implement whatever code the three cities put in place automatically in the UGA? Uh, or like, how, how, do, how do we get the overlays to match between the city and the UGA around affordable housing? That's, that's through the uh, joint planning processes that the county has restarted with the cities. In fact, we're meeting with the joint, the county commission at the, on the 31st with our commission to start the Tumwater process. And so that's where we see the updates needed to the, uh, the UGA development codes to match the policies and everything else that we've been talking about for the past 20 years to, to come out of that process. Great, thank you, that, that's really helpful. And then sort of my second one's more of a nerdy question. So. Of 60,000 units that are coming, half are in the urban area and half are out in the rest of the county and other cities. It, is that normal? Like, is that the kind of distribution that growth management intended? 
or should it be a higher number in the urban area? Well, based on the presentations we received from Michael with uh, GRPC on the buildable lands report, we're, we're meeting the GMA goal of getting more units in the urban areas. What we're not meeting is the sustainable thirsting goals of increasing the densities in our corridors and in our urban areas relative to the rural areas. So that's where we are right now. And, okay. and if I can add on to that, parallel to this process is we're also doing a joint planning effort for the Martin Way corridor with Olympia, Inner City Transit, TRPC, the county, and, and Lacey to look at how do you get more um, redevelopment investment along that corridor where you have your higher, higher rate of transit and those other type of amenities. Also, too, it's with the Growth Management Act, um, when that was adopted, we started adopting our first growth management plans. There are we're quite a few vested projects out throughout the county. And so as those projects you know, are realized, over time, you'll start seeing those numbers trend a little bit differently. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah, I wasn't, I just wasn't sure. It, it felt like maybe it should be a little more in the urban area, but I, I didn't know. So, okay, thank, that's really helpful. So on 1590, so I've got four more minutes on this agenda item. I just happened to have talked to quite a few members of the public about that very topic in the last couple of weeks. Um, and so I guess the, the so, so if we're going to have a conversation about 1590 and a regional or a countywide type of home fund and meet the sort of July tax deadline, the, the, the regional housing council would have to make a recommendation to the county commission before our next meeting so that the county commission could react to it before the deadline in April to begin to collect taxes in July. So I don't feel like that's possible if the regional housing council is in the middle. Now, if the county were able to do that conversation in parallel, I think we would all inform the process or be happy to join a process, but that's the dilemma I have right now. I, I don't feel like we can hurry up fast enough to meet that deadline. Um, and I know, I, I don't know that you know, I don't know that the county commission is there yet either, and they may rely on our advice and a recommendation. So th that's what's going on in my head, and we'll just open it up and see if folks have quick comments around uh, uh, the concept of, of looking at a, a, a fund countywide. Um, anyone? Michael? Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I, I, I agree a lot with some of the, the values that they can. Carolyn mentioned. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I see this as a really important tool. Um, I've had a couple conversations with some of us from, from our neck of the woods, and it seems like if we're able to do this on a countywide basis, that makes a, all the sense in the world to me that we now have a countywide entity being this council that is administering and, and trying to you know, make a dent into the housing crisis. It only makes sense that we try to make sure that we support um, that work by making sure we have the resources to do it. And in terms of timing, um, you know, I, I think it also makes just a world of sense in order to try to look at this as not just like dealing with the housing crisis that this survey reflects, but also the looming eviction crisis that is before us this summer as well. Um, Governor Inslee changed the eviction moratorium today to June 30th, and a lot of folks in my community are really breathing a sigh of relief at that fact. But, you know, that, that kicks the can down the road, and we're going to need to have a really solid answer and a really solid response for when that crisis does come to a head eventually. So I, I would really support um, Carolyn's idea of, of looking at this as on a regional basis and trying to see if there's ways we can expedite this as much as possible, as much as is feasible. Thank you, Michael. Romero? I, I hope you have a good idea because I'm, I'm struggling with the timelines. So. <laughs> Not necessarily a good idea, but maybe just a, 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 a status in the report and Commis uh, Commissioner Mejia can probably chime in. Um, I, I brought, um, uh, to the planning session to the Board of County Commissioners that we've had back in January 29, 2021 this year. All many, all many, the many different options in terms of generating revenue, including the uh, 1590. 
Um, it was a, 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 a very good conversation uh, with the board uh, and they sort of established somewhat of a priority. Uh, we have a medic one levy that is gonna be put on the August ballot uh, this year because we need to renew that. And I believe the conversation with the board members is how much um, uh, tolerance the, the public will have knowingly that we are in the middle of pandemic still. So related to the 1590, I was instructed to bring a, uh, uh, this item as a part of the conversation on the joint meeting that we have with the city of Lacey Council. And that is coming up on April, I believe mid-April. Uh, at that point, I, I believe the commissioners will have an indication you know, from the fellow elected officials where they are. Um, and so that's the status that I can provide uh, to you. In terms of the fast uh, deadline, um, and, and just from the logistical point of view, aside from what the commissioners will probably weigh in or not, that's very unrealistic to have something in place. Thank you, Romero. Any other comments? Okay. So what, what we'll do too is so um, Commissioner Mejia and I, when we meet in, in between meetings, uh, we'll talk with staff a little bit and, and have a little bit of better understanding where the county is and see if we can at least get a briefing uh, on the law and, and kind of what the options are uh, for, for the Regional Housing Council in one of the next couple of meetings. Uh, and then we can uh, decide if we want to, or if the county would like the Regional Housing Council to help with a planning conversation around that, or if they want to want to drive that just from the county end, does that seem like a reasonable approach for where we are right now? Okay. Okay. So then, um, thank you again to Thurston Regional Planning Council. This is phenomenal information. I want to make sure we don't leave on a on a taxing conversation. It, it, it's really helpful and it. I think one of the things that we want to make sure we talk about in all of our funding is whether there's an appropriate piece for monitoring this data like you talked about. So because we, we we need to keep keep up with it. I, I think when when Olympia first started doing an ad hoc committee five or six years ago uh, around housing, we didn't have any of that level of information. And it, it's really phenomenal. So uh, JW, they've been kicking butt at TRPC. So keep it going. Between that and the climate plan, I'm 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 just blown away lately. So, okay, so that will take us to um, item six, which is the interlocal agreement on 1406. Uh, Tom. Yeah, um, quick update. Then I think I turn it over to Romero and Scott. Um, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and language I believe has been agreed upon. Um, we had some some back and forth, um, but and I, I think I saw an email just before this this meeting started that. Um, um, the county and Lacey agreed on uh, language for the 1406. Is that is that correct, um, Scott or Ramiro? I believe so. That is correct. So Great. I think the so, final step would be just to have the one more final look from the attorneys, and I think we could advance this issue. It actually has gone to the attorneys and they're, they sent it on to us. So we'll try to turn it around as quickly as possible. That is a revised language that we agreed just two hours ago. Okay. Yeah, just, just another minor tweak. Yeah, so be careful when you make more changes because they'll turn it around as quickly as they can. So. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. well, so Romero and myself, should we at least maybe outline kind of what the, the spirit of language is trying to accomplish? Yeah, and I guess Romero, you correct me if I am not capturing this correct. So, I think the idea is there's putting a lot of faith and trust in the Regional Housing Council to come up with a regional project that would be funded with fourteen zero six dollars. Once the RHC has come up with that project and identified it, it would then go to each jurisdiction, legislative body, to essentially say that's the project we're behind it. And then once that has occurred, it would then go to the Board of County Commissioners for a final action on it. So the, that keeps the spirit of regional cooperation, that everyone's on board, everyone knows how the money's being spent, um, and then keeping the regional coordination of what a, a regional project is going to be going forward. Great. Does that capture that, Romero? Uh, yes, absolutely on point. So I appreciate the cooperation. And maybe I can just read the language for you guys to track on that. 
And, uh, and this, this, that is going to be a new item H. It with respect to the um, said, um, su supplemental House Bill 1406, the jurisdictions commit to original project using this funding. Further, the BOCC will not approve any projects until and unless each legislative uh, body will take an action to endorse the regional housing council recommendations. I think this is a, 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 a very good language. Uh, it, it captures the spirit and I think it eases some of the concerns that we heard in the last meeting. Yeah, and it keeps us in our fiduciary responsibility role, right? That's good. I, I like the way that came out. Any other comments on that one? Thank you for doing the hard legal work. Sorry if I didn't understand your question last month, Scott. It was probably the messenger, it was me. You're a pretty good messenger most of the time, so I, I think it was me. Anyway, uh, okay, so we'll go on to the RFP update, Tom. Oh, sorry. Actually, if I could just wrap up 1406, just to get clarity um, in terms of next steps, after hopefully the, the attorneys approve the language, do we need to come back in April to this body to take a formal vote to, to approve the amendment and then move forward? Or would you like us to send this to each jurisdiction for, for council action? Is anybody opposed to it going to the jurisdictions? It seems like it's ready to me. Do you want action now or? I just want direction. I want to know if I, we need to come back in April to get a formal vote or not. No, I think we have consensus to, to go ahead and send it to the jurisdictions. Yeah. Scott? I just throw one more thing out there, and I think this is just sort of, uh, we should be aware of it. If we end up ultimately deciding that we want to use a financial instrument like a bond, which then puts the county on the hook for a 20 year period, we probably have to come back with another interlocal agreement just to make sure that the jurisdictions agree that they're committed to this project. So the county is um, has some assurity to the bondholders that they're gonna pay the bills. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And I, I, ideally that would be when we have a larger funding source so we can actually consider bonding and have enough money for everything, so. <laughs> okay. Any other comments on that? Okay, Tom, the ILA, or I'm, the, I'm sorry, the RFP. All right, well, thanks for that. Um, RFP update is, is very short. The RFP went live at the end of February. We had, a, I think, what was a successful bidders conference. Um, we had over 40 um, folks join that bidders conference. Um, we are we answered some questions. Um, applications are gonna do, be due April 2nd. We're in the process of setting up a, a training session with our review team to go over the reviewing and scoring of those applications. Um, we'll be working with the RFP funding group to review and score, to train them on their, their role and responsibility come April. So that, that's really the update. The process is moving forward and we look forward to receiving um, lots of applications. Um, I think 40 or so have already been started in the online system. So that's my update. Great, any questions about the RFP? Carolina? Yes. Um, so compared to last year's, I mean, how is that? Is it normal for the, how many applications are usually received or started? Yeah. So um, last year was a small um, RFP process because it was most of them were two year grants. And so two years ago, I think in total, we received, I would say, around 65 or so applications. So I'm expecting some additional applications to start. Um, but there's some, I've seen some new applicants. So from organizations we traditionally have not seen applications for, um, but I think we're on track to, to have a, a robust response to the RFP. Thank you. Great. Good question. Okay, Any, anyone else on the RFP? Okay, so that will take us to an update on the safe parking and scattered site conversation, Keith. Yeah, I'm going to start and then I'm going to flip it over to Tom. Uh, the RHC Tech Committee met uh, several times since our last uh, 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 council meeting and we've continued the conversation around the uh, scattered site support program uh, and have developed what we think is a pretty solid proposal that Tom is going to be presenting to you this evening. 
Uh, it basically provides two types of service as we've talked about previously. One is kind of site support and the other is intensive case management. Uh, we think this is an effective way to respond to all of the individuals who are camping in our rights of way and uh, in informal uh, uh, encampments uh, on private and public property throughout our community, and also to deal with the impacts that those individuals and the, those camps have on the rights of way and on the, the surrounding property. So uh, with that, we'll be looking for your support to move this forward to a next step, which would be issuing an RFP for the case management services and with your support for using the, the dollars that the county identified for a safe parking program, but, but reallocating them for this program. So uh, I think also uh, County Manager Chavez has encouraged the RHC to look at this rather than a six month program to look at it as a year long program. And that's certainly the approach that the city of Olympia has taken. And that seems like a, 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 a good addition to this, this discussion. So Tom. I mute myself first. Um, thanks Keith, uh, you set that up well. Um, so in your proposal, I can share my screen if necessary, but in your meeting packet, um, there was the, the three or four page document for the proposed approach that the technical team has, has worked through. Um, so what, as Keith said, we're really looking for your kind of support to, to move forward um, with the county moving forward with the procurement process, um, the city of Olympia and Thurston County have an existing ILA around hygiene. And so we'd be looking to amend that interlocal agreement as needed um, to provide for additional funding for the site management component. Um, and then we also know that moving forward, we wanna kind of develop this as a model that can be used anywhere in the county. So if another jurisdiction wants to kind of um, have a site in their community where this model will be implemented, that there's a, a more robust, whether that's an MOU or other type of document that could be um, agreed upon with, with other jurisdictions. Um, so I'm not gonna walk through kind of bullet by bullet this proposal. Um, but really the purpose is to kind of set up a, a pilot project to see if we can come up with a, an approach that works for supporting those who are either living in vehicles or in unsanctioned encampments um, to help move those folks into permanent housing solutions, um, but also reduce environmental and community impacts that can occur from people living um, in situations. Um, in these situations. Um, and then we want to track the effectiveness of this program. And then we really had a lot, you know, how do, how do we develop a model that can be implemented in any community? Um, and we think we have that and it can be scaled up for additional sites. And so as, as Keith mentioned, it really comes down to two key components. One is a site management piece um, in terms of managing the garbage collection, hygiene services, any offsite storage, you know, if there's RV septic services that are needed communication with private landlords or other, other agencies, that those responsibilities really fall on the jurisdiction um, to manage those, whether that's, in this case, it will be the city of Olympia, but if it was a, this project happened in another community, it would be the responsibility of that, that jurisdiction um, to take on that responsibility, to procure those vendors, to procure those services, and to oversee those services. The second piece, um, of course, my dogs have to start barking right as I um, am talking. I apologize. Um, the second piece is site governance and case management. Um, so we're really looking at working with those individuals living in these sites, providing uh, case management, uh, coming up with some site governance rules, accountability, codes of conduct um, to reduce conflict between um, residents of those sites, um, provide that case management, housing search, and tenancy support. Um, to help move people into permanent housing. Um, so we've rolled, rolled out, laid out um, kind of broad roles and responsibilities for the county and then whatever participating city or jurisdiction. One of the things we did talk about um, was a funding um, that the county, and really when we talk about the county, it's using resources under the Regional Housing Council. So those document recording fees, 2163 and, and other funds. Um, of providing for some initial funding for cleanup 
um, to establish a base level of cleanliness in a camp, and then a, an amount of up to 50,000 per year for regular services, and then a, an amount of up to $10,000 for one-time emergency urgent needs. So the expectation is that these county funds would not necessarily cover 100% of the costs, but they form a baseline. So um, the city would be responsible for covering any costs above and beyond that amount. And then we've identified the, the three sites where we'd start this project, um, our kind of vehicles along Ensign Road, uh, the encampment off Deschutes Parkway, and then the encampments off of Wheeler Road. Um, with the goal of, of making this uh, for 12 months with a review after six months to determine if, if changes are needed. Um, the county's already pledged five, around 530,000 of existing resources for this amount. Um, a portion of that would go to the city of Olympia in this case to support those site services. Um, that actually would be a little higher than 150,000. That was, we've added that initial site cleanup and the emergency need. So we forgot to, to consider that or incorporate that additional funding in, into that service amount. Um, and then long-term um, wanting to explore a memorandum of understanding with all jurisdictions and then exploring whether there's an additional site where people living in vehicles may park safely and support it under this program. And then we laid out some, some broad principles of what success will look like and then what is probably unrealistic to expect from a, from a pilot project um, in this regard. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions um, or Keith or other folks from the technical team if they have other points that are, they wanna weigh in on. Go, go ahead, Keith. And if can, can you also mention the placeholder we have in our year end balancing for our portion of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, last night, our finance committee uh, discussed our year end balance, and they've included one hundred fifty thousand dollars to support this project, uh, plus potentially some additional dollars uh, down the road coming out of the American Rescue Plan funds, uh, potentially. One thing that I did want to mention real quickly is we did have a, a step forward from our friends at LOT. Uh, they have agreed to fund an RV pumping program up to $50,000, uh, and that would be available countywide. And the city has agreed to administer those funds and to administer that program as part of this scattered site program. So. Uh, we're working on an interlocal agreement to facilitate that, but uh, we look forward to making that part of this scattered site program. That's awesome. It is. Keith, how, how far would 50,000 go on that? Just it depends, depends on how what we are able to negotiate with the, the septic company for per unit service. Uh, in Seattle, that was around $150 per per service. So, you know, do, do the math, uh, it's somewhere around 400 uh, septic tanks uh, at $150. Gotcha. Michael? Thanks. Um, I was gonna ask about site cleanup since one of the public commenters had a question about that, but I think we sort of covered that in, in your comments, Tom. Um, so one of the things that I think is really interesting and, and is a really thoughtful and good idea, so this, this is just a comment, is the urgent needs fund sort of seems like it'll be inevitable that there will be things that arise mm -hmm. where someone might have a barrier that could throw them into even further instability and that that, that I think that is a wise investment to have included here. My, my question that I have is if Tom, could you go into some of the finer details on what the data collection will look like? Um, it's sort of strikes me that you know when we look at potential expansion to other jurisdictions that it's going to be really important to tell that story to show that um, this program has been successful and will be successful again and we can replicate the best practices that we establish so could you share a little bit more about what we might be tracking what that might look like and um, some of the other indicators that we might be hoping to um, achieve through the the pilot yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so one of the things we'll require the, our contractor, the case managers to do is to use our homeless management information system. So this is um, our you know, countywide, system-wide 
um, data system that we use. So by entering people into the HMIS, um, they can be prioritized, they can put on waiting lists for permanent housing or kind of access permanent housing. And then we can kind of track them through the process of when, once they are able to exit and we can, um, you know, we'll set up a project with an HMIS and then uh, that allows us to kind of track various data uh, through that system. So I guess I'd also call on Keely's a little more familiar with all the things we can capture out of that, that system. If, if she has anything to add around data tracking, but we'd really rely on the case managers to use HMIS as our data tracking system. So, um, hmm. so the homeless management information system uh, is, uh, depending on the project, will determine the kind of data that is collected. So um, the demographic information, the date where they enter service, um, and where they where they exit to, where they're coming from, and where they're exit to. So, so that's really really important data that shows where they're staying right now, and when and how long it takes for them to get into permanent housing. So, I think in terms of homeless management information system, that's going to be the most important, like the most vital information that we can get from that data. It's really important to note that. Um, that Washington state is the only state in, in the United States that is an opt-in to HMIS where the people have to expressly consent to be put into HMIS. We can still put in data that's de-identified, um, but we may not get as rich of a demographic data on some of the folks if they choose not to enter. Also, we do not collect identifying information on people who are actively fleeing domestic violence. So that can have an impact on the type of data. Otherwise, other outfits that are doing case management, they have their own tracking system. So they might have their own way of making sure that their referrals into services are being tracked. That information will be gathered. Whether that's an HMIS or not is a little bit up to that, that agency and the type of project that, that this um, becomes. If it's an outreach, if it's considered an outreach project, it will be limited to where were they staying, um, what refer, like what services did you provide, um, and whether they exited, and that that's it. Whereas some some other projects have more data. And that, those are statutory limitations in terms of provision of information and what we Correct. collect. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Makes it tricky for the PIT. Just putting it out there. <laughs> okay. Good conversation. Sorry about my double chat. I didn't realize I couldn't get something out to the attendees without changing, but I did answer Lisa's question. If folks are questioning where this proposal can be found, it's in the agenda packet uh, on the Regional Housing Council website. Okay, so Tom, you need uh, action. Uh, thumbs up to keep moving forward right now. Yeah, I think we're looking for whether that's a formal motion or a thumbs up, whatever you feel is necessary so we can kind of move forward with the next steps and, and begin, this, begin this project. Is anyone opposed to it moving forward? Okay, let's keep going then. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great. I, I love not having motion. So sorry, JW, were you raising your hand? No. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so that takes us to, I believe we're going to Megan Porter from Thurston County to uh, get an update on the communications plan. And I'll just point out we're slightly behind Megan. So I apologize for doing that to you. Hello, good evening. Um, Megan Porter, Public Information Supervisor for the Com County Commissioners. Um, I also serve as the lead for the Regional Housing Council's communications plan, um, communications team. Uh, the team met last week and uh, was attended by representatives from Lacey, Olympia, Thurston County. Uh, Tumwater was unable to attend and we quickly realized that we don't have someone representing South County. So Mayor Foster, I'm going to be reaching out to you to see if we could get a uh, team member for South County. Thanks, Megan. Thanks. Um, the, the conversation was really great. We, we were kind of trying to figure out where to start our communications around this. Um, what we quickly realized is that we need to kind of establish the identity for the Regional Housing Council. 
So the first six to eight months, we're going to work on, on establishing the who, what, why for the Regional Housing Council um, to kind of focus on the committees, the intent, um, and, and those types of things. And then um, with that, we're going to develop frequently asked questions and kind of hone in on the website, get that a little bit more polished. So those will be the first things that we do and then look for opportunities to um, engage the community. So if we could set up some open houses or forums or town halls, probably hybrid, virtual, depending on, on um, how the opening goes and, and where we're at in that. Uh, the, the first step that we'll do is develop the communications plan, which will include some of those components. We'll also ensure that everything is um, tying into the mission and vision of the Regional Housing Council. Um, and so we'll, we'll develop those strategies with that in mind and ensuring all of them are smart so that we can make sure that they're measurable and have those timeframes built into it. Um, aside from that, that's, that's kind of what we're working on at this point is getting those baselines developed, getting the communications plan developed, making sure that the, the website is, is usable and, and where we can direct people back to to get information about the, the council. Um, Carolyn? or Keely or Tom, do you have anything to add to that? I think you covered it pretty well, Meg. <clears throat> Thank you, Megan Thanks. and the team for helping us up our game on this. It's a really important. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to reflect really quickly that this, this was one of the cornerstone values that individuals identified for the Regional Housing Council that we'd be on the same page around communication on the very first time that I at least sat at the table. So super excited that this is happening. So thank you, Megan. Yeah, it's really, really exciting. So thanks for thanks for driving it. And thanks for make, keeping it in our minds that Carolyn from the very beginning, because I, I think it was really, really you that made sure we didn't forget that part. So. You're welcome. Okay. So that takes us to good of the order. It says quality in here. What does that mean and who's doing that? <laughs> I, I, I think that might be a, a typo. No, we had a, I didn't know if um, Keith didn't wanted to give an update and, and anyway. No, no comment. Okay, okay so that, Mayor, that's Did you there. have anything from a county perspective that you wanted to? Mm. Are you asking me? Yes. Um, well, this this was a, a public meeting this morning that I provided a, a proposal to the board uh, as to how we're going to be using the rescue, the, the federal rescue plan. And um, no decisions were made, obviously. Uh, I, I'm not expecting the board to make a decision. So there's brilliant ideas the county manager provides every once in a while. Uh, but one of the proposals uh, among the uh, many things was to consider setting aside uh, $5 million to purchase a motel um, for isolation and quarantine at this quarantine at this point. It will also serve as a, as a, as a, as an asset for transitional housing in the future. That was the proposal that I provided to the board. And, and again, among uh, many others, I, I don't think you have the time to listen to my ranting that related to the other um, elements of that proposal, but that was a uh, key on that. Um, we still have to wait until uh, it appears to be eligible, uh, but uh, we have to wait until the uh, guidance from the US Treasury come down to make sure that we, in fact, that is a possibility. But that was introduced uh, this morning for the board to consider. Thank you, Romero. And I'll add to that, that last night, the city council at Olympia, or the, the finance committee, Olympia, is uh, working through the draft of our first payment, which is um, to, uh, 10, no, is it 5.3, 5, 5.03 million. Um, and, and we would set aside a million of that, uh, theoretically, you know, we're not, we haven't made, no decisions have been made yet either, but a million for a regional project and our, our, committee at least was really excited about the possibility of that being a housing project. So uh, hopefully other jurisdictions are thinking that way with some of their um, uh, ARP funds as well. Um, anything else for the good of the order? Okay, so with that, uh, we're five minutes early. So 
Thank you, everyone. A lot going on, a lot of conversations. Until next month, we'll see you soon. We're adjourned. Bye, everyone. Bye.